Good evening and get ready. We have a lot to get through this hour because a lot happened in Minnesota today. As you know, four officers charged with the murder of George Floyd. We've seen the video. We've seen the body cams. We at Court TV have seen all the court papers. And today, inside the courtroom, arguments made by the attorneys for the officers and the prosecutors. They were going at it inside the courtroom, outside, protesters, people um, upset, obviously, with what everything that has transpired. But today is such an important day because we cover trials here on Court TV. But before you get to that trial date, I was a prosecutor. There are so many things that we would do ahead of time. All these decisions that are made before the trial impact the trial and can completely change the verdict of a trial. What evidence comes in? Who can testify? Who can actually prosecute the case? Unbelievable what happened today. Two key rulings. Let's talk about those right now off the top. And the first one, wow, a motion to disqualify the Hennepin County attorney granted by the judge. That means one of the key members of the prosecution team is off, is off the case. Unreal. Second one, a motion to introduce George Floyd's arrests back in 2007 and 2019. You know that the defense wants the jury to hear all about that. Well, guess what? That was denied. So the jury's not going to hear about George Floyd's prior arrest in 2007 and in 2019. That's just a little bit of what happened today. That's those are a couple of the big headlines. Let's bring in the best team of legal journalists in the business. Julia Janae, Court TV crime and justice reporter who's live in Minneapolis, and Court TV anchors Ted Rollins and Michael Ayala also with us tonight. Julia, let me start with you. Um, Officer Chauvin's attorney filed a lot of motions, a lot of paperwork, a lot of arguments today. We gave folks two of the big headlines about the um, prosecutor getting bounced and some of that information not coming in. What else? What else was argued today inside the courtroom? Vinny, he was in the courtroom today sitting with the other three co-defendants. This is one of the first times that we've seen former officer Chauvin in the courtroom because he is incarcerated. But we caught a glimpse of him being taken into the courtroom, in courthouse rather, through the back door. And it's a long list of motions that were on the table for all of these defendants. So starting with the four major ones that his attorney was arguing today, two of those are ones that all of these uh, defendants had filed motions for. First, you mentioned that motion to disqualify the Hennepin County attorney. That was granted. That was one that was specific to Chauvin's case. But also that motion to dismiss and the motion for change of venue. That's one that a lot of these defendants were asking about about asking this court to rule on. The judge decided to reserve ruling on those. Didn't even want to hear arguments today on the motion to dismiss because he said he's got enough of the briefs. He's going to take it under advisement. And then that Rule 404 evidence motion on those two different arrest dates, the judge said unequivocally that the 2007 arrest was too far outside of anything related to this incident and asked the defense teams, how is it even possible that this is relevant? Event, and he said that that definitely will not be coming in. But that May 6, 2019 arrest, the one where reportedly George Floyd swallowed uh, drugs and had to get medical treatment while he was being arrested, the judge said it can't come in. It looks like it's propensity evidence. But if the state opens the door by saying that there's no way that he overdosed or ingested drugs, that that could be a way that the defense can get that in. All right. Um, Michael Ayala, I want to bring uh, you into this conversation right now, Michael, because um, I'm, I'm looking at what's going on here. And we were talking about this the other day and we were discussing how big today was mm -hmm. and specifically those prior arrests of George Floyd, mm -hmm. how large they would be in front of the jury. To me, this is a huge victory for prosecutors today. Yeah, you know, it was interesting because um, the judge actually put them on warning. So it was a victory, but it had a little bit of a caveat with it, right? Because he told them, he said, look, 
you you know, and we've heard before that they wanted to say that the fact that he might have uh, taken these drugs at the scene was a little bit preposterous. So he said, look, if, if you're going to try to make that argument in court, I'm going to let these guys bring in, uh, guess what, this 2019 arrest where he did exactly the same thing. So he put them on notice. But you're right. Right now, as it stands, big victory for them. The jury's not going to hear about all this bad stuff that um, uh, he had done before, Floyd had done before. And I thought there was an argument that could be made, and one of the attorneys did make it. He said, I want to get these in to show the devious nature or evasiveness of this guy. And the judge says, no. The propensity part of it is just too strong. If we put this in front of a jury, it could be really problematic. So, yes, it's a big win for the prosecution. Meanwhile, Ted, um, the prosecutor from Hennepin County gets bounced from the biggest case yeah. of his career. Oof. Yes. I mean, this is a killer for him personally. Uh, I'm sure that the prosecution is going to be fine without him. Uh, and, but can you imagine uh, this case coming to your lap in... in and you are told that you're out. Um, uh, it's very uh, hard for that individual. In the grand scheme of things, eh, who cares, right? The, the, the prosecution will go on and be just fine. But huge blow to this man. Are you saying he's no Ben Matlock? Is that what you're saying tonight, Ted? <laughs> uh, there are plenty of Ben Matlocks up there in Minnesota that will fill right in. Uh, but... To your point, it's got to be a huge blow. And I'm sure it will cause a disruption because they've already come this far. Absolutely. All right, Julie Janae, change of venue is a big deal. Tutau, one of the other officers, he's the one who's standing and, and kind of facing the crowd uh, that we see in the video. Wants the, the venue changed, made some arguments today. What's the status of all that? You know, that's another one of those motions that multiple defendants join. All four of them want this motion, this venue to be changed out of Minneapolis to another place. And he made those arguments. The attorney for Tutau argued that it's going to be different if it's in a different venue because of the danger of what could happen if there's a verdict that the public doesn't like. And the judge asked, are you saying that if this happens in, for example, Moorhead, that they're not going to be concerned there, that the streets will burn in the in the Minneapolis area, but not in their area. So really interesting back and forth between the attorneys. But the judge said he is going to hold off on making a ruling on that because he first wants to send out a summons to potential jurors to see how they feel about this case, what they've read about it, and then he will make a decision. So really, he's going to have almost a preliminary void dire before he gets into whether or not this case should move out of Hennepin County. And there was also a motion for a sequestration of the jury and to make it anonymous. That was also one that the judge held off on because he wants to uh, see more about what the public response is. But he did talk about all of the threats that he personally has gotten over this case. And he said that's an indication that we may need to keep the jury off the record for their own protection. You know, Ted, the more I'm hearing from this judge, the more I'm thinking he's, he's, he's you know, very practical. Like, we're not going to change venue until we find out we can't do the trial here. I mean, that's the way it should always be. The, the criminal defense bar is always jumping the gun, trying to get these things moved left and right, but without even trying. Right. And you're talking about moving it from the largest population area in the state to a smaller area. Um, it, on its face, it's ridiculous. I love this judge after today, after hearing the way he talked through all of these rulings and that he didn't rule. You know, he did not feel the need to rule from the bench on some of these motions, keeping his options open. I think he is going to run a very well thought out trial here. And, you know, uh, you always... A, a judge is basically a referee, but a good judge can make all the difference, especially in a high-profile trial like this. You know, Michael, I'm not going to commit to love the way Ted did until I find <laughs> out if this judge is going to permit the world to see this trial. Yeah. Because I think the world needs to see this trial, especially this country. I mean, it, it, the, the impact of this case uh, is, is difficult to even quantify. And, and I think if a, if a verdict just pops out of a courtroom and no one sees anything, that could be problematic. I think the, the world needs to see that. Um, do, do you agree on that note and on the note that, hey, let's try to let's try to try the case and where it happened? 
Yeah, you know, yesterday, uh, Julia did some interviews with some folks on the street, and I was struck by one of the citizens who said, you know, it happened in our county. We want to judge it in our county. And that's how the system is set up. If you commit a, c a crime in a certain county, you should get uh, judged in that county. You should be uh, judged by the jurors in that county, Juror jurors of your peers who are your peers. So, yes, I think that's a great idea, the way the judge is handling it. I think the way he's handling it inspires confidence. And, you know, I go back to what you've said many times, transparency. Transparency is the key. This is not a case just for that county. This is a case for the world. This has affected the world, a movement worldwide. This is what Court TV is about. This is what we're for. He should let cameras in there, let everyone see how this case is adjudicated. He seems like a man with a lot of confidence, a lot of smarts. So why not let the world see what's going on in that courtroom? I think it would have a positive effect on the overall outcome. Absolutely. Uh, Julia, the other thing is, are we getting one trial or are we getting four trials here? Do we know? That's another to be determined, Vinny. The state had two motion, major motions that were on the table. One about joinder, because they want all of those uh, issues to be dealt with at the same time. And the judge said he is going to reserve his ruling on it. He wants to hear more from all of the parties on their opposition of that situation. But these defendants argued that their defenses are going to be antagonists. They don't want to have to put out exactly what their defenses are. But there was also a filing by the state last night where they listed Derek Chauvin's prior incidents, all of his use of force incidents that they obtained from the police department. So that's going to be a game changer because it shows a different defense that these parties may choose if the state goes on the offense with that material. So the judge was very candid about that being a real game changer. So he could not make a decision on that today. Yeah, Michael, th to me, this is the most difficult one uh, of all of them. Should it be one or four? Because I understand the arguments uh, on both sides. But the one thing about this case and, and the theory that prosecutors have put out is that they're all kind of working in concert with each other, literally aiding and abetting. So to me, I kind of lean towards one trial. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because Chauvin's attorney made an interesting argument in court today. He said, if my client is um, let off, if he's let go, if, he, if he's not convicted, then there's no need for the other three trials because there's no underlying crime to have aided and abetted in. So I think there might be a case made to say, OK, because Chauvin, there are some different facts, some different evidence, as we saw with the uh, motion brought by the prosecutors today. There's also some suggestion there'll be evidence about his prior relationship with George Floyd, that that doesn't affect the other uh, defendants. So perhaps you separate it, you do Chauvin, then you do the other three together, provided that there's, of course, a conviction of Chauvin. But if there's no conviction, then there's no need for the other three trials. So I thought that was an interesting point he made in court today. That's a very interesting argument. All right, uh, Julie J., do we get a trial date today? And how long is this trial going to be? We do have a trial date that the judge has not changed. It's March 8th. There are still a lot of issues that still have to be worked out. But at the end of this hearing today, he said, I'll see you all on March 8th. And he said that he is anticipating six weeks for this length of the trial. All right. We've got a lot more to talk about. We talked about what was happening inside the courtroom, but there was also a lot happening outside the courtroom, outside the courthouse. Julie Janae was in the middle of all of it. We'll talk about that when we come back.